Welcome back. I'm Lynn Hilton Wilson, and this is Jack Welch. We're thrilled to be able to finish up King Benjamin's sermon here. One of the most beautiful sermons in all the history of the known sermons given in this world. It is so inspiring. And today we get to finish up chapters four, five, and six. Not only do we have a lot of ideas on this, but Scripture Central and the previous Book of Mormon Central had many I think it was 17 different no whys are short little videos that have fabulous information on King Benjamin's sermon. Jack, what are your favorites? Favorite no whys? On these on King Benjamin's sermon, yeah. Well, well, uh, they're all which of my children are my favorites, you know? <laughs> these are so good, but uh, bleeding from every pore. That's in no why number 520. There's one on the day of atonement. We're talking here about how the atonement and this seems to be connected with the uh, Feast of Tabernacles on the Jewish festival calendar. We have a know why 479 on how the scapegoat was used to carry away our sins, symbolizing as a type and shadow, which Benjamin actually uses those words, yeah. of Christ and how he would come. So there are lots of fun little uh, and shareable explanations of these things. Earlier, we had talked about the whole sermon is beautifully um, connected and intertwined and chiastically um, organized so that the center point is on the coming uh, to the realization and accepting of the atonement. But today we are going to start looking at where we start with the people's reaction. They've heard the sermon and now we get to hear their willingness, their humility to enter into this covenant. Do we ever express our willingness? We, we do. And we say yes. Uh, we may just bow our head and say yes, but we express our willingness. And here they view themselves in their own physical state, carnal state, less and than less the than the dust of the earth. You know, we are made of the elements of the earth. And so as, we are less. And we are even less because at least the earth will obey God. And we sometimes do not. Notice that they uh, they do call out, don't they? It says they cried aloud with one voice. And what do they say? Oh, have mercy and apply the atoning blood of Christ that we may receive forgiveness of our sins and our hearts may be purified. For we believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who created heaven and earth and all things, who shall come down among the children of men. And Benjamin, of course, has included that. He just saw it. This is a, a little paraphrase of that 10-word name yes. that Benjamin received from the angel. And that was in chapter 3. It's shortened a little so that there are not quite so many words. Seven, though. Jesus Christ, Son of God, Creator, Heaven, Earth, all things. But now they're filled with the Spirit which I see this as a being born again. You know, the Spirit is the cleansing agent. Joseph Smith taught that over and over. It's not the baptism that cleanses you. It's the Spirit that can cleanse you. And the, I see Christ having implemented the atonement, but the Spirit is what carries it into our own lives. It transfers the atonement into us. And it's not just thinking. It's oh, no. the Spirit. You know when that comes upon you. You feel that. It's, uh, we call it the burning in the bosom. And when you've been cleansed, it's called the the baptism by fire. You know, it's it's a real feeling when you feel the forgiveness of the Lord. And what does this give them? They were filled with joy, having received a remission of sins, and having peace of conscience. Mm. This text is so real because it does reflect the details of an actual spiritual experience how like this. How hard repentance is. And we have to go through the depths of despair before we get our peace. And it's just the peace of conscience. When you, when you think maybe of a peaceful lake. Okay. And, you know, the, the, the water is calm. Uh -huh. And, you know, it's not bubbling up. And, you know, your conscience, when it is peaceful, you're calm about it. It, it, it no longer hounds you or uh, makes you feel inadequate or problems. The, the, the atonement can give you that peace. My peace I give unto you, Jesus says. But it's only when we trust in him. 
if we still think what should I have done or what could I do? Yeah, those nagging. Yeah, those aren't the issues. The issue is I have to trust in God. I I trust that He has the power of forgiveness, and then that great blessing of peace. And it it comes in in this case, and I think it comes in many cases as we participate in ordinances like baptism, and we know that we are doing what the Lord has required. This piece, Benjamin didn't say to people, well, just go out in the forest and think for a little while, and when you feel good about yourself, come back. No, he actually gives a whole set of things that we have to do in order to receive a change of heart and to maintain it. Right, and we talked about those last time. These are kind of conditions of the covenant. Yeah. And, uh, and those conditions are for our good. They're not just barriers that stand in our way, but they are preconditions to make this feeling possible. And they have felt it. And we we can experience and relate to this, but notice how specific and how... I, I just love how detailed this comment and all of these words are. It says to me that... This is not fiction. We are getting here a historical record that is precise and is accurately describing what they actually were feeling. Well, having them respond that way now allowed Benjamin, in verse 4, to again open his mouth and begin speaking unto them. How does he address them here? My friends and my brethren. And my kindred and my people. And so he says, okay, I'm going to call attention. Let's get back to work. There's more to be done here. Uh, And and, and you'd think, well, why doesn't it stop right here? They've been born again and they've or had the spirit. Maybe our sinning will begin with a lack of faith. And we need to be instructed on how we can properly believe. And Benjamin knows this. And he says, all right, you've, you've done well. Verse 6, you've come to a knowledge of the goodness of God and his matchless power and wisdom and patience and all of that. But there's more. We must be faithful after we have entered into this covenant. And faithfulness, as we've often said, doesn't just mean believing or thinking. It means actually acting and doing. Yeah, he calls it in the middle of verse six, be diligent in keeping the commandments and continue in the faith. I I just feel like I become selfish. I become tired. I become lazy. It's not that I'm wicked. I just, I just become a little prideful and I want things my way instead of always thinking about other people and always thinking about what God wants. Well, and, and we need strength. We need help from each other and from the Lord And it's when we fail to turn to those righteous sources that we may feel uh, overwhelmed in some way. Now, we've talked about belief and faith. It's both action. It's faith is both mental and physical. It is thinking and acting. Yes, I believe so. And it's loyal. So what Benjamin now first does, he wants to tell us what we should do from a believing perspective. Point of view. I counted them up. There's six beliefs here. That's right. And then the final part, the, the rest of this chapter will be then spent on what we need to do. Okay. okay. So let's, what are these six things? Believe in God. Okay. Number one, we believe in God. Sounds like the first article of faith. Amen. Sounds like the first of the 10 commandments. And what do we need to believe about believe God? That he, believe that he is and that he created all things, both in heaven and on earth which I also feel like goes into this temple text of the law of consecration because it's his, it's not ours. It's his earth. We are just stewards of everything. And then number three, believe that he has all wisdom. Number four, he has all power both in heaven and earth. And this is what Benjamin's talking about with omnipotence. Yes. And And it's not just power in heaven, but also he has all power on earth. As the creator, he put it all together and he could take it all apart if he wanted. So he has all power on earth as well as in heaven. And then the fifth time he uses believe, 
Believe that man doth not comprehend all things which the Lord can comprehend. Is that hard for us to believe? Oh, it is such a problem because right now we have such an ability to hear what other people are thinking and to hear the other's ideas that we're bombarded with ideas that are not from God. And um, so we have to trust God knows the end from the beginning. It's also hard in my own life when I want something now. I want a job. I want a a, a marriage. I want a child. I want a, whatever it is. You know, I want it on my time table. And we have to realize, no, we have to believe you do not understand God's timing and wisdom. Why does Benjamin say we have to believe that we do not comprehend all things? What do you think it is? Well, I, I think we have to recognize our limits yeah. and it's not wise to argue with someone who knows more about something than you do. <laughs> Meaning God. <laughs> like yeah, God, yeah. yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And so he's, he's giving us a, 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 an array of different things that will be helpful for us to believe. It keeps us humble, Jack. We're meek when we realize that. Yeah. And that's coming up. I think that when we ponder something, uh, we, we take it apart, we dissect mm -hmm. it. And to analyze means to take the pieces apart. But when we synthesize, we put things back together again. And I think here we're getting a good example of breaking down the elements of belief and a good checklist. Do I believe this? I've got a problem. Let me begin with number one or number two, adjusting my faith to be in tune with who God is and what he knows. And once you've done that and you've analyzed and taken the pieces apart, then you turn to synthesizing. And that's when you put things back together. Well, I think that's what he's talking about with the next believe, because it's, and again, believe that we must repent. And isn't repent just doing exactly what you said? deconstructing and then reconstructing. You know, why am I behaving this way? Why am I doing these things? And how can I change? How can I return to God? Put the pieces back together properly or repair broken parts yeah. and it will run better. What does that mean to forsake them? Leave them behind. Do not repeat them. And I think re repent for me is return to my loyalty to the father and the son. That's the right, son. because we do become servants of the devil. If we, we serve him, it says. King Benjamin taught that very well. And to forsake, like you say, it means to leave. Just leave them behind. We must believe, we must repent and forsake and humble. And ask in sincerity of heart that he would forgive you. And that to me is the key. If we can go through that process of stopping it and really changing our heart and sincerely pleading before the Lord for forgiveness, that's when we reveal that joy. And he finally says, and now if you believe all these things, see that ye do them. So that's when our six believes are finished and now we're going to turn to the doing. And that's where it really gets interesting and it where gets it harder. begins. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. Verse 11 is where we now um, start with the doing. I say unto you, as I have said before, that as ye have come to a knowledge of the glory of God, if ye have known of his goodness, and he starts listing them. So you've come to this knowledge um, and you have tasted of the love and have received a remission of your sins, which they've just experienced. And it caused such great joy in your souls. Even so, I would that you should remember and always retain in remembrance the greatness of God, your own nothingness, his goodness and long suffering towards you unworthy creatures and humble yourselves even in the depths of humility, calling on the name of the Lord daily and stand steadfastly in the faith of that which is to come. And that's more than a checklist. This is a beautiful chiasmus, and the center is your own nothingness. If we would remember to be humble, we could repent a little bit easier. What do you think it means to retain in remembrance? Uh, to retain, you know, means to hold on to. Okay. And it takes effort to retain. And as we get yes. older, it's harder to remember things. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> in any condition. Uh, if you don't relive things, if you don't repeat things, 
it will fade out of your active awareness. And you don't want that to happen. That's why we go to church every Sunday. We partake of the sacrament. We pray. We read our scriptures. And talk to people and share with them. And we serve others. This is all part of the retaining. Yeah. And what we must retain is an awareness of our own nothingness. Tell me what Latter-day Saints should take away from that. Are we really nothing? I don't think nothingness means valueless. What do you think it means? You're right, I think. It, it has to couple with, first of all, you remember the greatness of God, and in comparison, our nothingness. And if we lose that, if we don't retain in remembrance uh, the greatness of God, then it means we are replacing God with something else. Yeah, and it's usually our natural man, our own wants, our own desires. Let me just say, as we conclude this little uh, section of, of uh, admonitions by Benjamin, uh, there are little posters or uh, postcards that you can get. You might make one for yourself on believe. Here's your list of believes and put it on your refrigerator. So we have the change into our next section, the sixth section on what to do, starting in chapter 4, verse 13. Let me give a little overview of this section on right. what Benjamin would like us to do. Okay. And that's what he wanted his people to do. And so what is it that Benjamin wants us and his people to do? There are basically three areas that he will focus on here. Okay. He mentions them in the first half of this section and will then mention them again in the opposite order in the second half. Not surprising. <laughs> to review and, you know, if you say it once, say it twice, maybe people will remember. But they deal with property. What should you do with property and distributing it? And uh, uh, secondly... Uh, what you should do in teaching your children and others yes. to obey the uh, laws of God. And finally, uh, the importance of giving to the poor and uh, the beggars. Again, creating a Zion society, the law of consecration, making sure there is no poor among us. Now, I'm sure there are many other things he could have included, uh, but we might ponder why these things. Well, he said, I, I really loved this statement when he says, if you want to retain this remission, if you'll feed the poor, if you'll clothe the naked, if you'll teach your children. And I don't think he's just talking about our own. I think it's my responsibility, my community to help out um, in any way I can. Um, and it's not just the young ones. I think he's talking about all those that are within our sphere. I think that's right. And I think when we ask God to give us a lot of things, yeah. maybe it's fair for him to ask us to do some giving too. And in distributing our property and fulfilling our debts and obligations, Benjamin wants to be sure that we not only do that with our fellow beings, uh, but we're asking God to fulfill his covenants to us, mm -hmm. so it's fair for us yeah. to need to do that. So I think if you think about it, this isn't just social justice. This is justice in the context of covenant making with God. I love the fact that he carefully crafts verse 14. Suffer your children that they go not hungry and naked. Neither will you suffer that the transgressor of the laws of God fight and they quarrel with one another. And I thought, how do you stop your children from fighting and quarreling? And then he tells you how. I, I love this. But ye will teach them to walk in the ways of truth and soberness. You will teach them to love one another and to serve one another. So in the middle of the fight, you may not be able to calm them down right then. But if you, for hours and hours every day, work on, let's follow what Christ taught. Let's go back to the scriptures. Let's follow our Savior. I think we will um, stop the quarreling and the fighting. And not just in our with children, but in our communities, in our churches, in our schools. Um, if we can follow the principles of Jesus Christ to love one another and serve one another, I think we will stop the contention. Yeah, I do too. And I think we learn a lot from Benjamin about service. And mm, yes. one of the things I think he wants us to learn is that we want God to serve us. We, we would like to be helped in ways, but if 
we're not willing to help other people. So, so God is asking us, please serve. And we will learn to be more like God when we do what he does, which is serving. He will teach them to walk in the ways of truth and soberness. Well, what about soberness? Well, sometimes it's from in, um, drinking things you shouldn't, and sometimes it's just from bad behavior. When you're angry or whatever, you're not being very sober. I think it's being clear-minded. Is that it? I think so. And a lot of things can fuzz your clarity of thought. And Lack of sleep, it, even. <laughs> and it, it might be drugs. It might be uh, other things. But here we have an admonition to, to be, be sober. It can even be anger can change us from thinking clearly. And I think it's also related to the word sophos, What's that? which means wisdom. Oh, sophistry. Yeah, yeah. When you are sober, you are wise and conscious. You're aware of things and aware of consequences. And not just that you are aware that I am doing something, but why you're doing those things. I think that's sobriety. He really spends most of these next um, verses on how to minister to the poor. I think this is really crucial to him. He's trying to raise this people up to a higher level. He does not. He's trying to make mm -hmm. a Zion society. Mm -hmm. And so he how says, can we do this better? We all know that we need to do something along this line. I, but... love, I love verse 17. Perhaps you might say the man has brought upon himself his misery. Therefore, I will stay my hand, and I will not give unto him of my food, not impart unto him my substance, that he may not suffer, for his punishments are just. But I say unto you, O man, whosoever doeth this, the same has a great cause to repent. Because except you repent of this which has to be done, ye perish forever, and hath no interest in the kingdom of God. You know, because God says, are we not all beggars? You know, God says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't say his cause is just. You have no idea what he has endured, what his background was, where he is now. You just give, give, give. Even if you're poor, say in your heart, I would give if I could. That's verse 24. I know. That's a beautiful statement. Yeah. You yeah. know, and I think here he's, he's first thinking about responding to people who come up to you and say, I need help. Yeah. I, uh, you know, and please help me or I'm begging for something. I need something. Yeah. It's a little easier to do that when people ask for it. Sometimes it's hard to invite yourself into their life if they don't want that. Right. And they don't want to be embarrassed by it. So we have to uh, be wise about how we do this. I'm also sensitive to the fact, though, that... Um, he says, do things in wisdom and order. And just sometimes giving perhaps would make a situation worse. And we need to make sure we're taking care of the need in a real way. So we have to do things in wisdom and in order as well. But have a generous heart. Be generous. Want to give. Want to take of our excess to help with theirs. Or even with our want to share with them. And I think it also helps to... I'm not just here to share it with you, but I want to be your friend. Mm, of course. You're going to feed them more than... Build relationships and and to to be able to not make them feel less because they need something. What Benjamin recognizes is that we all need a lot and we all have a long way to go. As the king, he knows that we're only going to get there together. That if there's trouble in anywhere in his kingdom. He can't go down and take care of that. He needs all people to be alert to places in which help is needed. You know, Benjamin gives a if-then statement in 21. If God, who has created you, on whom you are dependent for your lives and for all that you have and are, doth grant unto you whatsoever ye ask that is right in faith, believing that you shall receive, Oh, then how ye ought to impart of your substance that ye have one with another. And if ye judge the man who has put up his petition to you for your substance, that he perish not and condemn him, how much more just will be your condemnation for withholding your substance? I mean, I think he is as clear as he can by saying, wait a minute, you're saying you're not going to feed this person who's hungry and help them find housing because... 
you don't ever need those two things in your life. <laughs> the tables can turn pretty fast. They really can. This is not a political issue. This is an issue of divine importance. We have all got to help each other. And then he ends this beautiful section with, finally, <laughs> that's verse 29, huh? <laughs> finally, I cannot tell you all the things whereby ye may commit sin. I think that's a very important point. We don't really become righteous by following a checklist. There will always be things that will come up that we aren't expecting. That's why we're here to become perfected. We keep refining ourselves. We keep, well, we don't refine ourselves. The Savior keeps working with us. We keep repenting. We keep learning more and growing more. Yeah. And so the, the gospel is, is open-ended in a lot of ways that uh, opportunities will come our way and we need to be prepared. And in fact, he even says in verse 30, but this much I can tell you that if you do not watch yourselves and your thoughts and your words and your deeds and observe the commandments of God and continue in the faith of what you have heard concerning the coming of our Lord, even into the end of your lives, you must perish and now, O oh man, remember and perish not. Um, so th this that's why I say we have to be in tune with the Spirit. This is why it's so important that we have it with us all the time. If we aren't watching our thoughts, we may be sinning. Anyway, he does end this, uh, this section having told people, here are the conditions of this covenant that you uh, have asked that you can enter into. But they haven't made it yet. That's chapter 5. So he's giving them the conditions. This is the problem with making the covenant. You're going to now be held responsible. So we turn the page on to chapter 5, and Benjamin looks out, and what does he see? He had thus spoken these words. He sent among them to desire to know if they believed the words. And they all cried with one voice again. We're back to that um, idea of a possible ritual, a possible hymn, a probably uni unity in their thoughts. We believe all the words that thou hast spoken unto us. And we know with a surety and with truth because of the spirit of the Lord omnipotent, which has wrought a mighty change in us. Now, this is interesting, Jack. He's saying that the, all the people are feeling this, and yet they had to individually, he sent out among them to find out. Mm -hmm. So it's an individual um, feeling of the spirit, of that sanctification, the, the cleansing that the spirit can bring. I, I think you're right. And that, that first verse, he does ask his people, and I, I suppose individually, do you believe? Do you believe? And I think they all said yes. And having said that it was kind of like a uh, maybe a baptismal interview of some kind that they were now ready and prepared and wanted to have a mighty change in us and in our hearts that we have no more disposition to do evil but to do good continually and we ourselves also this is verse 3 of chapter 5 through the infinite goodness of God and the manifestations of his spirit have great views in which it has come. I, and I, I feel that his desire to have more faith in these people to be good is something that I have felt many times. But then the next morning comes or the afternoon comes and something disastrous happens. And, and, and we, like a game of shoots and ladders, we're down at the bottom again. Yeah. Um, and how do you get back up? I, th I think you begin by having these great views. Ah, you've seen it on the mountain. You've made the covenant. Do you think the word here could mean visions? If we have a view of what we're going to accomplish and where we're going to be. If we have a vision of what we're, what's a potential. Yeah, if we understand the end from the beginning, definitely, I think that's a good word. These are our goals, but we have a, we can envision what this will be. And once you have adopted that as your goal, and you can see it. I can see this happening. Yeah. Now you're prepared to move forward. Well, and I love the idea that holiness or sanctification comes line upon line, and and we take three steps forward, and then there's a little undulation, and we've stepped backward, but we're stronger. We have more spiritual sense, and we can move forward. And And I think in verse 5, they are telling him, we are willing to enter into this covenant with our God. Okay, we know the ramifications. To 
We want to do his will, to be obedient to the commandments and in all things that he shall command us. And the remainder of our days, I, I just think this is so beautiful. They're willing to covenant, even though they know human nature is going to be a challenging. The wording of the covenant that will then be administered by King Benjamin yeah is indeed a precursor of the sacrament prayers, okay. which we find first in 3 Nephi chapter 18, when Jesus is min administers the sacrament there, and, and then again in Moroni chapters 4 and 5. Yeah. And you can chart these. You can put the, uh, the words, so how did Benjamin's words relate to Christ's yeah, words in 3 Nephi? And... Uh, we can see that our sacrament prayers are indeed the ancient order as was revealed here by, exactly. by Benjamin and developed as uh, Christ then fulfills the, uh, the atonement so that we now can partake of emblems of the atonement and make the covenant much the way these people uh, under Benjamin's administration did. Well, here King Benjamin is asking them to believe um, in a way that this covenant is going to be made. And I love um, verse seven. And now because of the covenant, which ye have made, ye shall be called the children of Christ, his sons and his daughters. For behold, this day he hath spiritually begotten you. Therefore ye say in your hearts that ye are changed through faith on his name. Therefore ye are born of him and have become his sons and his daughters. This new identity is very real. Correct. And I, I think that's a part of this naming that they, they are now going to be known as the children of Christ. Yeah. In verse 8, in addition to becoming now called the children of Christ, collectively, they individually take upon themselves, take upon you the name of Christ. That's the wording that... Uh, uh, we have in the sacrament prayer. Yes. That you must have entered into the covenant with God, that you should be obedient unto the end of your lives. And now we're coming up to chapter 5, verse 10, 11, 12. And I have in my scriptures marked, this is the first chiasmus that was found in the Book of Mormon. Tell us a little bit about it, Jack. Give us a first-hand account here. Well, sure, Lynn. Uh, I enjoy telling this story, and I'll keep it real brief. There are places where you can find this on YouTube and also a Know Why that we now have. It gives you a little written version of this story. But to me, it is still a miracle. It's still amazing that I would have been in a place, in a time, uh, with people for all these pieces to come together that I would learn something that I had never dreamed about and never would have. But you were a missionary. You were receiving inspiration from God. I, I was a missionary, and we were trying to do our best, and we prayed that we would be led and directed, and we hoped that we would meet people whose lives we could bless and who we might be able to teach. And those prayers were answered yeah, in many ways, and they are for missionaries everywhere. So this one, one instance uh, began when my companion and I were just walking uh, by a bulletin board there in Regensburg, Germany, where we were the only missionaries in that town. There was a notice that there would be a series of lectures about the New Testament that would be... Uh, uh, given that summer. And I thought, well, we could probably learn some things there. We walked in and sat down in this lecture. The, actually, we only attended this lecture once because we had conflicts every other Friday when it was uh, being taught. But once was enough. And you think the Lord helped us to get there when this professor was talking about it? Well, I think so. What was he talking about? He uh, said, uh, I just found a book that I'm very excited about, and it's uh, this book by a man named Paul Gector, who was a Jesuit, a Catholic priest. Uh -huh. But what's the book say that helps him answer that question? Well, the, the book is called The Literary Art in the Gospel of Matthew. Okay. 
and it makes some very strong claims about how Matthew uses chiasmus in a Hebraic way, and that this provides what Gector was calling very strong evidence that Matthew was originally written either in Hebrew or using Hebraic thought. Because of the way he paralleled his, the words. And, and uses these inverted parallelisms. Well, the next step was we went to a bookstore and asked there in the Catholic bookstore if they might happen to have a copy of this. As you can tell, this is a monograph. It's in a series, and so it's not a regularly published book. Unusual for a bookstore to have something like this. Okay. Academic, and they had one copy of it. And so I, as you can see here, I studied the Gospel of Matthew in German, looking up all of the examples that Gechter had given and reading and finding others as well. So I, I had done my homework and went back to work knocking on doors and yeah. talking to people. And, and I talked to some people about this and asked if they'd ever heard of it. And of course, the answer was no, okay. because this book was published in 1965, only two years before the time I bought the book. Okay, so it's still very new. Yeah, scholarship. and that's just another little part in the step. If I had been a missionary two years earlier, this book wouldn't have even been in existence. Yeah, the Lord's timing is the miracle. So lots of things did fall into place. Okay, so, okay, so how does this all relate to the Book of Mormon? Well, then, uh, as I was thinking about this and so on, I very early one morning, have a very clear impression. I like to think that it was words, but it was something that woke me up. Okay. And it was before the sun had come up. Uh -huh. So it's early, four o'clock maybe. And, uh, and the clear words were, well, if it's evidence of Hebrew style in the Bible, it must be evidence of Hebrew style in the Book of Mormon. And, and I didn't go back to sleep. Of course not. And I didn't want to wake up my companion, you know, but I, I got out of bed and I, I did uh, go and get my Book of Mormon. Oh, I just sat down at the table where we read the, uh, the Book of Mormon before we went to bed. Okay, so you just had your scriptures already out, so you sat down right where you were. Right there and turned on a little lamp. And are you in the German or English? German. Okay. Thought, well, I'll start where we left off. Yeah. And that was in Mosiah chapter 4. So as I turned the page on Mosiah chapter 5, it didn't take long for my eye to notice two words, two big, long German words that are the words for transgression, übertretung, übertretung. And those two words were right on top of each other. In the German translation. In our English one, they're a little bit offset there. But we're talking about chapter 5, verse 11. Yes, and that this name will never be blotted out, ausgerottet, except it be through übertretung, transgression. transgression. The English says, therefore take heed that you do not transgress. Yeah. It makes it a verb. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But the German said, therefore... Guard yourself against transgression. So it's the exact same word. Übertretung. Übertretung. So you are caught this. That the name be not blotted out of your heart. So, you right. so those okay, four words. Two. You said, okay, here's two. Now, are there any others? And you kept looking. So, yes. And then I just started going, well, how above that, below that? And, of course, you can see that you are not found on the left hand of God. Now, the left hand of God only appears here in all of Scripture that I can find, and it appears twice. This has to be intentional. Oh, of course, oh, of course it is. Yeah. You don't do five words in a row and then five words out without it being intentional. It comes to pass that if you will not take upon yourself the name of Christ, you must be called by some other name. Therefore, you find yourself on the left hand of God. I would that you should remember that this is the name that should never be blotted out except it be through transgression. Therefore, and that's the turning point. Yeah. Wow. 
Okay, don't transgress. Name be not blotted out. I would that you should remember, retain this name, that you're not found on the left hand of God, but to hear and know the voice by which you shall be called and also the name by which he shall call you. I was pretty excited. I love that. The name he shall call you. But you found that one in the wee hours of the morning. And did you feel the spirit? I bet you were ecstatic. It was hard to distinguish the excitement from the spirit, but I think it was both. So it was was spirit squared. (laughs) And, of course, I, I, you know, I... I was, you know, looking real care. Wow, what is it? I woke my companion up and... Oh, dear. Yeah. Oh, what's going on here? <laughs> but he had been at the lecture, too. He had, yeah. too. And, yeah. of course, he appreciated. And, you know, uh, that discovery day was literally the turning point of my mission. Your hump day. Hump day. We served for two years, and it was f- the morning of... The beginning, first day of my second year. <laughs> so it Your was. Your Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's uh, briefly the story of how that was discovered. But I also just feel strongly that all of our scripture study can receive personal revelation in our own lives, and it can bless not only our missionary work, but it can bless our own lives and drawing closer to the Lord. You know, this is a miraculous experience that has blessed all of the church members since that time, but who know about it and who could read the scriptures from that perspective. But your scripture study, my scripture study, our scripture study can also have powerful spiritual ramifications if we pray before we study and if we take it to the Lord and we consecrate our time in the scriptures with the Lord. Um, Now, before they said there were too many people to count, but now they are going to take the time to write their names down. If they've entered in this covenant, um, that's verse one. And I feel like the church is established in Zarahemla. It's a very short chapter six, but um, they make this oath. And in a few verses, we then have Benjamin stepping down and his son, Mosiah, stepping up as the next king. And um, the oath is continued. Mosiah, verse 4, says, Mosiah began to reign in his father's stead, and he did begin to reign in the 30th year of his age. So it says in verse 6, um, King Mosiah did walk in the ways of the Lord and have deserved the judgments and the statutes, did keep the commandments. And, you know, he's tilling the earth, he's doing everything right, but he reigns under his father three more years. But next week we'll start on King Mosiah's um details there and we'll get some flashbacks and some other things but right now it's been such a joy to be able to talk about king benjamin's sermon with you lynn this has been a real joy to go through king benjamin's speech in this kind of depth and uh, i know we've talked about a lot of details Uh, i hope everyone has picked up enough and can realize that there's been a lot written about king benjamin's speech and a lot is available Don't feel overwhelmed or intimidated, but have a a sense of excitement about discovery. I I was certainly excited when I found chiasmus, but you can be just as excited. Anyone can be excited about what they learn that becomes something that they take ownership of and then do something with. And the Lord will open our minds. I know that. And we'll put things into our way that we could not have orchestrated. And his hand is in this work. And how it comes to pass is not for us to really always know the end from the beginning. We walk by faith. I know that he has guided my life and has sustained me in this effort. Uh, It's not just the discovery, of course, that that was just a starting point. I received an email just uh, two days ago from a scholar in England who is now working on chiasmus in the Gospel of Matthew. And he had gotten my email address and has asked me some questions. And this is not an uncommon occurrence. So it's been a way in which I can relate to and we can share the Gospel and... Let people 
understand and see things that they wouldn't normally have seen. So in a way, this little academic pursuit helps us to appreciate a lot of things about the truthfulness of the scriptures. I think the Lord wants things to be balanced and credible, and there need to be good things that can be said, because we know there will be incorrect and wrong things that are said. It's for us to sort those out. I believe that in many ways, this is just one example, that the Lord will not leave us orphans. He will be by our side, and he will help us to know uh, the truthfulness of his work. This Book of Mormon is, in many ways, a miraculous book. The presence of chiasmus in the book may be one of the greatest or most accessible miracles, and may be the most informative because you learn something about the text when you read it this way, when you read King Benjamin's speech over and over again, when you memorize it, it's a tool that will help. It unlocks interconnections and you can understand and appreciate and embrace. Well, the message of Christ is the greatest miracle of the book. Yeah. yeah. And you can see Christ more by seeing the right. chiastic third patterns. Nephi. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And Christ is the center. And so often, names of Christ, like the Lord God Omnipotent, will be mentioned twice to drive home for us the importance of Christ being at the center of this. And what's the very center of all of King Benjamin's speech, as we said? The atonement. And how you must put off the natural man and become a saint through the atonement of Jesus Christ. That is the center point of everything that Benjamin is doing here. So God does speak in ways that we can hear, ways that we can be impressed with, and we can know that this is not just an ordinary book, that his word has a distinctive fingerprint. And when we know the fingerprint, we can recognize the mind and will and word of our Savior. I know that to be true. And I am so grateful for what it has meant to me and to others, many others. And I pray that it will be something that will, this year, as people are studying the Book of Mormon, will make the book even more valuable and precious in their lives. We're not through with chiasmus. Oh no, we're just in Mosiah. <laughs> Until we get to some of Alma's. But come back next week and we'll have more. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.